Uh, good morning again. Good morning. Uh, welcome along this morning. I am really looking forward to this message. Perfect prophetic proof of Jesus Christ's identity as the Messiah. That's a mouthful, isn't it? But you're going to discover that this is a most blessed message from God's Word. I love that beautiful hymn, Turn Your Eyes on Jesus. And in this message, we will do simply that. We will turn our eyes upon Jesus. And so you will really love this message. As I pointed out, it is one of my favourite messages um, that, that I have been given the blessing of sharing. This morning, as always, we need to open up by asking God to be with us. Amen? We need to ask Him to guide us as we study His Word. Now, I hope everyone's got a Bible. Does everyone have a Bible? Anyone not have a Bible? Okay, looks like everyone has a Bible. We are all ready to, ready to go. So let's ask God to be with us as we open up his word together. Father in heaven, we count it a privilege to come before your throne of grace. We ask and pray now as we open up your holy word that you will open up our hearts, that we may be ready to receive the precious truths concerning Jesus, the one who is the saviour of the world, the one who alone we put our faith and trust in. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for the privilege of opening up your word and we know that you will speak to us. We claim the promise in your word that if we abide in your word, we will know the truth, the beautiful truth that will set us free in Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You'll remember from... Last weekend, we looked at that most amazing prophecy in Daniel chapter 2, where God revealed to ancient king Nebuchadnezzar what would happen from his day all the way to our day and beyond till the coming of Jesus. You remember that rock at the very end of the dream that was cut out without hands symbolized Jesus Christ. Rock. Symbolized the coming of Jesus, symbolized, symbolized that eternal everlasting kingdom that God would establish, that would put an end to all the human kingdoms that have been established ever since, ever since the time of Adam and Eve. We looked at some amazing prophecies in the Bible. However, as important as those prophecies are and as wonderful and interesting as those prophecies are, do you realize that those prophecies and knowing them will not save us? Those prophecies and a knowledge of those prophecies will not save us. There is only one that will save us. And that is not knowing the prophecies, but knowing the one who is at the centre of those prophecies. And who is that? Jesus. Jesus. You are spot on. Let's look at our first scripture this morning, John chapter 17, verse 3. And let's ask the question, how can we receive eternal life? How can we receive eternal life? John chapter 17, verse 3. I have the page numbers of those... A red Bible, but I don't think anyone's got a red cover Bible. I think we've got enough of this Bible, so we won't need to worry about that Bible. I had the page numbers up there on the, on the whiteboard for you. John 17 verse 3. This is Jesus here speaking. It's in red. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So here Jesus is very clear. Eternal life is not knowing the prophecies, but knowing the one who is behind the prophecies. Knowing who? God and Jesus Christ who is sent to know him, to have a relationship with him. That is, and that, what, and that is what constitutes eternal life. The same author, John, if we go over to 1 John, little John, at the back of your Bibles, just before the book of Revelation in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, here we also discover a beautiful truth of how you and I can have eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, this is what John writes, and this is the testimony, that God has given us what? Eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So the Bible is very clear. The only way you and I can receive eternal life is by knowing God and Jesus Christ. Also, the only way you and I can receive eternal life is by knowing Christ, knowing Christ, by, by having a relationship with Him. If I say to you, I know my wife, I know my children, what am I simply saying? I'm saying that I have a relationship with them. I know them. That alone will save us, a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
What great claim did Jesus make? He made an incredible claim in the book of John. So we go back to John, where we were. John chapter 14 and verse 6. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Notice the claim that Jesus makes. John 14 verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through who? That's an incredible claim that Jesus made. He made the claim that he alone can offer eternal life. He alone can offer eternal life. Before we accept the invitation of Jesus, we need to ask the question, several questions. Is Jesus really the only way? Was Jesus who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Saviour of the world? Or was he, as many claim, just a good man who had some wonderful teachings to share? Is there prophetic evidence in the Bible that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God? It's all good and well for you and I to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. But is there prophetic evidence in the Bible that puts pay to any sceptic out there, no matter how sceptical they are, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one who came and who was born in Bethlehem? Well, I believe that there is, and that's what we explore this morning together. In Matthew 16, 13, Jesus asked the question of his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Notice Peter's response to the question of Jesus. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the who? The Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter believed it. And Peter was willing to put his life on the line. There were many, thousands upon thousands, millions in fact, down through the ages, who believed that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be, the Son of the living God. They were willing to spend countless days and months and years in prisons because of the fact that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Millions were willing to be, to be placed before ravaging beasts and be torn apart because they believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Saviour of the world, and He was who He claimed to be. Well, this morning, you and I need to examine the evidence. Was Jesus really the Messiah? Was Jesus Nazareth, the Messiah. If you go over to the book of Daniel chapter 9, we are going to look at one of the most amazing Bible prophecies that I have come across. A prophecy that beyond a shadow of a doubt pinpoints Jesus Christ as the Messiah of the world. Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. If you've got a little bookmark, place your little bookmark there. We'll be moving outside of Daniel, but we'll be coming back to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to pick it up in verse 1 and verse 2. Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now let's just take reflect on what Daniel here is writing. You'll remember that, that Daniel and his friends, in fact, Judah and Benjamin, they were taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar back in 586 BC. And they are in Babylon. And God had predicted through his prophet Jeremiah that the children of Israel would remain in exile in Babylon for some 70 years. Notice what we read here in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verse 11. A prophecy that God gave through his servant Jeremiah. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of who? Babylon for how long? Seventy years. And then notice what God promised would take place at the end of seven years. In Jeremiah 27, 22 we read, They shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, says the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this what? To this place, I will restore them back to Jerusalem. And so Daniel here is reading, he's reading the scroll of Jeremiah, and he recognizes that the time is almost up. It's almost time for God to deliver. There's only a couple of years left, and the 70 years are up. But guess what? They're, 
There doesn't seem to be anything taking place. Everything seems to be going on as usual. And so, and so Daniel is wondering, is God going to be true to his word? Is he going to bring back the children of Israel from exile in Babylon back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, to rebuild the temple after 70 years? Or have the people gone so far that God cannot fulfill his promise? And so what does Daniel do? Daniel begins to pray. This is a powerful prayer. It's the seventh and final prayer in the book of Daniel. And it begins here in verse 3. What verse did I say? Verse 3. We don't have time to read the entire prayer. We'll just read this first part and then we'll look at the very conclusion of his prayer. Notice how Daniel begins to pray in verse 3. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. Wow! Daniel takes off his, his ministerial robes and the Bible says that he puts on, on, on sackcloth. He, he places ashes on his head and he fasts. What's the big deal about fasting, sackcloth and ashes? I'll tell you what the big deal is. It's, it's a sign of the deepest possible repentance. It's a sign that, Lord, unless you intervene, we are dead. We are goners. A dead person doesn't need to eat. That's why there is fasting. A dead person doesn't need clothing. That's why sackcloth is chosen. Usually rough, rough kind of skin. Usually camels or, or, or ram skin was placed upon the individual. An individual also, also places ashes upon them because what happens when you die? You turn to ashes. So what Daniel here is saying is saying, God intervene. If you don't intervene, we will never get back to our homeland of Jerusalem. We will never rebuild the city. We will never rebuild the temple. Let's carry on in verse 4. Verse 4. Now on the 24th day of the first month, sorry, I'm in chapter 10. Let's get back to verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Verse 5. We have sinned. Wow. We have sinned. This is Daniel and he is including himself with the sin of his people. Guess what? There is nothing in Daniel that points out that Daniel was, was, was a terrible man. He was a sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. The Bible's clear on that. But Daniel, later on in verse 23, is referred to as greatly beloved. There's not one spot of dirt on Daniel and his life. He, was, he had an impeccable character. And yet he includes himself as part of those who have greatly sinned. And we read on, and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Verse 6, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all people of the land. And then Daniel goes on and prays. We don't have time to go through this prayer. If you've got some time, some time, go through the entire prayer. It's one of the beautiful prayers in all the Bible. But well, we're just going to go to verse 19. Let's go to the very end of Daniel's prayer, verse 19, over the page. Notice how Daniel concludes his prayer. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by what? Your name. So Daniel is pleading on behalf of his people. What happens next? Let's continue reading in verse 20 and onwards. Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man who? Gabriel, the archangel, right there at, at, the, very, at the very throne room of heaven, God's first angel, leading angel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly what? Beloved, there it is, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the what? The vision. The vision. So here Daniel is told by Gabriel that God will give him the answer to his prayer. And what's Daniel praying for? Daniel is praying, Lord, will you fulfill your covenant promise that you made that after 70 years you will bring our people, your people, back 
from Babylon in exile to Jerusalem. But guess what? God will now, through his servant Gabriel, give to Daniel a message that goes way beyond the restoration of Jerusalem and the temple. A message that goes way beyond God delivering the children of Israel from exile. A message that goes right to the very heart of the Messiah coming to deliver the entire world from the exile of sin. This is an incredible prophecy, an incredible prophecy, and we are about to unpackage it. Why does God give Daniel even more than what he asks? That's because the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What is God willing to do for you and I when we come to Him humbly in prayer? He's willing to do for us exceedingly abundantly than what we're asking. Daniel is asking for this. God says, I'm not only going to give you this, I plan on giving the entire world everything. My very own son. And we're going to unpackage that right now. Let's go to verse 24 to 27. We're going to read it straight through and then we're going to pull apart this passage verse by verse, little by little. Verse 24. Here is, here is what Gabriel shares with Daniel. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Verse 25. Now therefore, sorry, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war desolations are determined. Verse 27. Then one week. In the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. There shall be one who which is determined on the desolate. Now wow, what does all that mean? Well you and I have the opportunity to find out exactly what this means and it's not going to be any surprise to anyone is the very prophecy about? Who is this very prophecy about? The very center of this Bible prophecy is the Messiah. The very center. How do I know that? Turn over to verse 25 with me. Notice what it says in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until who? Messiah the Prince. Who's Messiah the Prince? That's Jesus. A very clear term for Jesus. So this prophecy at the very heart, yes, this prophecy is about Daniel's people returning from exile to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. Yes, this prophecy also, as we will discover, is about God's probationary time that he gives to his children, children of Israel as his ambassadors to the world. But this prophecy goes beyond that. This prophecy goes to the very heart of who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Prince. How long would Israel's probation be? Let's take a look at verse 24. It's right there in Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Very clearly, God says that the children of Israel would have 70 weeks, 70 sevens. Those of you who are good at maths will know that's how many years. Well, 490 days. 70 weeks of 490 days. But when it comes to Bible prophecy, whenever we're examining the prophecies of the Bible, we understand that a day represents how long? A year in Bible prophecy. That's a, that's a, a, a common understanding that most scholars have today. One day represents a year in Bible prophecy. Notice this passage here in Numbers 14.34, and I could give you many like it, but this will suffice. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your... One year. Is that true? How long do the children of Israel have to wander through the wilderness? 
40 years. How long were the spies in the land of Canaan spying out the land? 40 days. So we all know that one day represents one year when it comes to Bible prophecy. We always must allow the Bible to interpret itself. It really doesn't matter what I think or what you think, but it matters what God thinks. And God has given us the symbols to unlock the prophecies of the Bible in the Bible itself. Where do the symbols come from? The Bible. Where does the interpretation for those symbols come from? The Bible. You and I don't need to go to any other books. The Bible does a very good job of interpreting itself. A very important principle. And a lot of people go all haywire when it comes to Bible prophecy because they bring in their private interpretations. In fact, the Bible tells us very clearly that prophecy is not of private interpretation. It's not for you and I to conjecture, for you and I to, to, to wonder and to guess. Bible prophecy is given to us so that you and I can understand those prophecies by understanding what the symbols represent. And they are all there to be found in the Bible. What will the Messiah do amongst his people? Notice what it says in verse 24. As we continue reading, in verse 24 it says, To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting what? Righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint who? The Most Holy. So what's Jesus going to do? Jesus will reconcile. He will reconcile all those who are in sin. He will reconcile them to the Father. He will make an end of sins. Seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. That is what Jesus would do. Well, when would the 490 years begin? This probationary time that God gave to the children of Israel to make a decision whether they would continue to be his ambassadors to the entire world or whether God would have to choose or appoint another group to be his ambassadors to the world. When would that 490 years begin? You and I don't need to guess. It's there in the text. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build what? Jerusalem. So... The 490 year prophecy, those 70 weeks that are determined for your people and your holy city will begin by the com from when the command is given to restore and build Jerusalem. Now do we have this command? Do we, do we know when that began? We most certainly do. If you go to the book of Ezra, it's given there. We have the very command that was given for the children of Israel to go back to Jerusalem to restore the city as well as to rebuild the temple. Ezra chapter 7. Just before the book of Psalms, Ezra chapter 7 verse 12 and 13, page 644 of your Bibles. 644. Ezra chapter 7 verse 12 and 13. Which verse are we beginning with? Verse 12. Very good. Are we all on the same page? I can see a few people still flicking. I'll give you three seconds to get there. And let's begin. Verse 12, Ezra 7 verse 12. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and so forth. I issue a what? A decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to where? Jerusalem may go with you. So here it is. Here is the decree. The decree was given. But when was it given? We don't have a date here. We still need a date. Without a date, the decree, I mean, is only halfway there. We have the date. And if you go to verse 7, we are given the date when this decree was given by King Artaxerxes. Notice verse 7. Some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim, came up to Jerusalem in the what? In the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So here we have the date when the decree was given for the children of Israel to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and rebuild the temple. When was the seventh year of King Artaxerxes? Historians clearly tell us that the seventh year of King Artaxerxes was 457 BC. So here we have a date. So from 457 BC, the children of Israel had how long? 70 weeks. Or how many years? 490 years. So let's just put it up here on the screen. 
And we'll come back to this diagram. So here we have it. 457 BC, the decree is given for the children of Israel to go back to rebuild Jerusalem. 457, 490 years takes us all the way to what year? 34 AD. Now you're thinking, if you're really good with maths, if you add 457, if you add 490 to 457 BC, you come to, 20, you come to 33 AD rather than 34 AD. What we must do, when we go from BC to AD, we must add a year, because there's no year zero. We went from 1 BC to 1 AD. So in order to have our calculation um, correct, we must add a year for the year zero. Okay, so what did the prophecy say? There'd be seven weeks, and then there would be 62 weeks. Seven plus 62 is 69 weeks. And then there would be one final week. Let's pull it apart some more. As we continue on, we will do just that in the moment. Messiah, it's the Hebrew word. In the Greek, that same word is Christ or the anointed one. That's what the word Messiah literally means. It means Christ or the anointed one. Notice in John 1, 41 and 42, we have found the Messiah, which is translated what? The Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. You remember the story of the woman at the well, John 4, 25 and 26. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called the what? The Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am what? I'm he, I'm the Messiah. Jesus made it very clear to the woman at the well that he was the Messiah. You see, God has sent Messiah figures all the way down through Israel's history. If you take a look at the Bible and the history of Israel, you'll find that there were Messiah figures who were priests, there were Messiah figures who were prophets, there were Messiah figures who were also kings. In fact, a, a pagan king was, was, was a Messiah figure, Cyrus, who delivered, who delivered the children of Israel, oh, sorry, who, who God would use to take over the kingdom of Babylon, as we already discovered last weekend. So that's what simply Messiah means. Someone who is anointed to deliver people. And so Jesus would come and he would be the ultimate deliverer because he would deliver us from what? From our sins. Amen. When was Jesus anointed? When was Jesus anointed? go back to up there on the screen. In the interest of time, I've put a number of scriptures up on the screen and this is one of them. Acts chapter 3, verse 38 we read, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? the Holy Spirit, and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was what? Okay, so Jesus Christ was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, when was Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit in a very special manner? Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit from his very birth. We're told, we're told that, that Jesus was miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit. But in a very special way, when was Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit? We go to the book of Luke, chapter 3. Luke, chapter 3. Luke, chapter 3. And here we have the answer. Luke, chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. When Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit in a very special manner, at the, very, at the very outset of his public ministry. Luke chapter 3 verse 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was what? Yeah. Baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the what? And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am what? Well pleased. So here at his baptism, the Bible teaches that Jesus was anointed in a very special way by the Holy Spirit, signifying that his public ministry had begun. Now, do we know when this event took place? We most certainly do. You go over with me to chapter 3, verse 1. So go back a page, Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Here we have a date given for the baptism of Christ. Luke 3, verse 1. Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, 
Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Euteria, and the region of Traconitus and Licinius, that's a mouthful, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Wow, can't believe I got through that. Here we have a specific date given for when Jesus was baptized. The 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. And we know from history that the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar was 27 AD. What year was it? 27 AD. So that's when Jesus was baptized. In fact, the reason why I struggle to get through all these names is because God had a purpose in putting all these names here. It was just filling up space. This, in fact, is one of the most incredible time prophecies that you will find in all of Scripture. In fact, ancient documents didn't have this many details concerning a special date. Why did God give us all these different individuals who ruled at that particular time in history? Why did he do that? So that you and I will have no doubt that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's the reason. So God went to great lengths to give all these names that I have so much trouble pronouncing and you do also in order to make it very clear that Jesus Christ came right on time, began his ministry right on time in 27 AD. So there we have it. 483 years from 457 BC brings us exactly to what year? 27 AD when Jesus began his ministry. Don't take my word for it. Notice what Jesus had to say. In Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus came to Galilee. This is after his baptism, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is what? Fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus recognized that he was the Messiah, that yes, he came right on time. He began his ministry right on time. Someone should say amen. 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 What an incredible prophecy. But it's more than that. It's more than that. Notice what Jesus shared when he came in to his hometown of Nazareth and he, and he stood up to speak in the synagogue there on one particular Sabbath. Luke chapter 4, let's pick it up in verse 16. Luke 4 verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Notice that word. Have we come across that word before? We most certainly have. Anointed. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now pay attention. Notice verse 20 and 21. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is what? Fulfilled in your hearing. What was Jesus saying? I am the Messiah. I am he. And if you continue reading, they recognize that Jesus was saying just that because they took him up on the brow of a hill and they were going to push him off the cliff. Welcome home. They probably did that after potluck. I don't know. That was the introduction that Jesus received to his ministry from his very hometown of Nazareth. Jesus made it very clear that he was the anointed one. He came right on time. He began his ministry right on time. How could God be so specific? How could he be so specific? Get the exact year? That's because God knows the future. And he sees the future more clearly than you and I see the very present here today. Notice what the book of Isaiah says, chapter 46, verse 9. Remember the former days of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the what? The end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God can be so accurate and so specific because God knows the end from the beginning. That's good news. That's good news because that means God knows exactly 
where I am today and where I need to be tomorrow and the next day. And I can put my faith and confidence and trust in a God like that. Well, what would ultimately happen to the Messiah? Let's keep reading Daniel 9.26. Back to Daniel. So I hope you've got your little bookmark there because we really need to keep scooting along. Daniel 9.26. Notice what will, what will ultimately happen to the Messiah. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, that is, you remember there was the first the seven weeks, and then there would be what? The 62 weeks. Okay, so in other words, after the 69 weeks, Messiah shall be what? Cut off, but not for himself. The Messiah shall be cut off. What does that word cut off literally mean? That word literally means killed. Was Jesus killed? After he began his ministry, a, sh a certain time of ministry most certainly was. Jesus was killed, but not for himself. So who was Jesus killed for, if he wasn't killed for himself? He was killed for me, and he was killed for you. He was killed for the entire world. That's what the Bible is trying to tell us. Jesus was killed. He was cut off, but not for himself. Notice what Isaiah writes. In Isaiah 53 verse 5, a prophecy concerning Jesus who would come and he would be cut off because of you and because of me and because of the sins of the entire world. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are what? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The Messiah was cut off because of your sins and my sins, willing to die a most horrendous death that you and I cannot even begin to imagine. Notice what John the Baptist cried out when he saw Jesus coming towards him to be baptized at the beginning of his ministry in John 1.29. Behold the Lamb of God that takes what? Takes away the sin of the world. Well, when would Jesus be cut off? Well, when would Jesus die for our sins? Here we have the answer in verse 27. Then he, this is the Messiah, shall confirm a covenant with many for how long? For one week. Okay, that's that final week in the 70-week prophecy. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But in the middle of when? In the middle of the week, he shall bring an Messiah in the very midst of the week. What's, what's in the middle of seven days? What's the very center of seven days? Three and a half days. Three and a half days. Not rocket science. So Jesus would die. He would be cut off. He would bring an end to sacrifice and offering in the midst of the week. Three and a half years later. How long did Jesus' ministry last? It lasted exactly three and a half years. Jesus began his ministry in the autumn in the northern hemisphere of 27 AD and he was crucified on Passover what? Friday in the spring some three and a half years later in 31 AD just as the Bible predicted he would. Notice Jesus was crucified on the 30, on, in 31 AD in the spring the first month the 14th day crucified exactly on time. He was the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. That's why Christ was crucified on Friday because that's when the Passover lamb would be slain. And Jesus was that lamb that takes away the sins of the entire world. Well, let's get even more specific. Notice how specific God is because he doesn't want anyone to have any shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Savior of the world. What time of the day did Jesus die on Good Friday? We all agree Jesus died on Good Friday. Are we all agreed on that? Everyone's agreed on that. Every year Good Friday comes around and we know what happened. Jesus died on Good Friday. Passover Friday. Not necessarily the Good Friday that, that we keep from year to year. That's another story for another day. But on Passover Friday. 
What time of the day did Jesus die on Good Friday? The Bible tells us, Luke 23, verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, which is midday. Okay, that's how the Jews reckon time. The sixth hour of the day was midday. And there was darkness over all the earth until when? The ninth hour. Now if the sixth hour is midday, what do you think the ninth hour may be? Three in the afternoon. Okay, three hours after, after, after the sixth hour. If the sixth hour is midday, the ninth hour would be three in the afternoon. Notice what took place. Then the sun was darkened. So this is at three in the afternoon. And the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He said this, he breathed his what? So what time did Jesus die on the cross? He died at three in the afternoon. Why is that significant? Why does Luke include it in his gospel? I'll tell you why he includes it. Because at three o'clock in the afternoon on Passover Friday was when the high priest took that lamb that represented the Messiah who would come. And he took that lamb and he placed that lamb on the altar and he took, took, and, 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 and he took a knife. And right at three o'clock in the afternoon, he was going to put an end to that lamb's life. But right then the Bible says, the temple, curtain, dividing the holy place and the most holy place, the curtain was, was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that this was, not a human, this was not a human initiative. Human hands didn't tear this, this mighty thick temp, uh, curtain, but this was done by the agency of God. And that took place at 3 o'clock. And Josephus, Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, he records what took place. The priest had the knife in his hand and he was about to slay this Passover lamb. And all of a sudden he saw the, tur the, the curtain torn in two and everyone looked from the holy into the most holy place which was, which, which was not to be done. And the priest dropped the knife in horror and he cried out, Ichabod, Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord has departed. And Josephus declares that that lamb got startled and the lamb ran away. That's because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ took the place of the lamb of God. He took the place of the lamb that was there on the altar at three o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus Christ died right on time. In fact, Jesus died after being on the cross for only a few hours. Do you know how long people lasted on the cross? Anywhere from between three to seven days. That's how long people lasted on the cross until they finally gave up their breath. But Jesus died after only a very short time. You remember the thieves? What did they have to do to the thieves? They had to break their legs when they came to them. But when they came to Jesus, they realized that he was dead. He was dead. He had died. He had died right on time. Jesus would confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's what the Bible tells us. In Daniel 9.27, it tells us that he would confirm a covenant with many for one week. Notice what Jesus had to say on, on, on Thursday evening. On Thursday evening, notice what Jesus had to say to his disciples when he broke bread and he drank the wine that symbolized his body and his blood that would be shed for many. Notice what Jesus had to say, Matthew 26.27. Then he, being Jesus, took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. Notice these words. For this is my blood of the new what? covenant which was shed for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus here in these words that he shared with the disciples, he was pointing out that yes, I will fulfill the covenant with many. How many is the many? It's everyone. It's everyone. This is not just a prophecy for a few people. This is a prophecy for the many for the entire world. For the remission of sins. So here we have it. Jesus was baptized and began his ministry right on time in 27 AD in the autumn. He died right on time three and a half years later on Passover Friday at three o'clock in the afternoon when the Passover lamb was to be killed. We have three and a half more years left until we get to 34 AD. Half a week. What was to take place during that half a week, those three and a half years. Well, we don't need to guess. 
because Jesus told us. He, in fact, warned the religious leaders that they had three and a half years left of grace to make their decision whether they would continue as a nation to be God's ambassadors to the whole world or whether they would relinquish that privilege and give it to some others. Notice what Jesus told the religious leaders on one particular occasion. In Matthew 21, 43, we read these words. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be what? Taken away from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Okay, so Jesus said, if you will not accept me as the Messiah and accept the privilege of being my ambassadors to the entire world, proclaiming my love, my goodness, my mercy, my sacrifice, if you won't, I'll give that privilege to another nation that will bear the fruit. He reminded his disciples of this very thing. Notice what Jesus said to them that they were to do. In Matthew 10, verse 5 and 6, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. So Jesus told the disciples that the children of Israel, yes, they would reject him as the Messiah. They would even crucify him, the leadership. But God in his mercy would still give them more time. More time. What a gracious God we serve. Amen? What a gracious God we serve willing to give us more time. I thank him for that grace, for that mercy. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, you read, you read the first six chapters of the book of Acts, and it's the history of God seeking to reach the children of who? Israel. Yes, there are some Gentile stories thrown in there, but by the, the bulk, God's work is for the children of Israel. Well, what happened in 34 AD? that sealed the fate of the children of Israel as God's ambassadors. God's ambassadors. What sealed their faith as God's chosen nation in 34 AD? If you read in Acts chapter 7, you will come across a man filled by the Holy Spirit. Deacon, filled by the Holy Spirit by the name of Stephen. And Stephen preached a powerful sermon to the Sanhedrin. This was the highest official body of the Jewish nation. This was their highest body, the Sanhedrin. And he preached a sermon proclaiming that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. And he pleaded with his people, he pleaded with his people that they would accept the Messiah and that they would turn from their sins, that they would repent. And notice what happened at the end of his sermon. At the end of his sermon, we read these words in Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Then they, that is the Jewish leaders, cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and did what? They stoned him. They stoned him. They rejected not Stephen, but the nation of Israel, the leadership. We're talking leadership here. They rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And notice what it says in verse 59. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Those words echo the words of Christ on the cross. You remember? Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Receive my spirit. And so that's what happened in 34 AD. That officially sealed that officially sealed the time of probation that God had given to the children of Israel. That they would make their choice once and forevermore whether they would choose to be his ambassadors to the entire world or not. 34 AD came, God's final appeal to his people after 490 years. And they rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as a leadership as a nation, not as individuals. We're going to get to that in just a moment. Notice what Jesus had said in Matthew 21, 43 to the religious leadership. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Did this take place? It most certainly did. If you continue to read in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, this is what we read. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of where? 
Judea and Samaria. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And guess who was one of those who was doing the persecuting? It was the Apostle Paul, who was formerly known as what? Saul. But in Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 9, we have the conversion of Saul, who becomes Paul, the greatest evangelist in the Christian era, the one who proclaimed Christ more fully than any other human being on planet earth since the time of Jesus Christ. And so we have the message going throughout all the world. No longer is it a message that will specifically be given primarily to the Jewish people, but after 34 AD, the message was to go to all the world. And so now God used both Jews and Gentiles. And notice what the Apostle Paul says. Notice who the ambassadors for Jesus Christ are from the time of 34 AD all the way to the second coming of Jesus. Here, here it is. Galatians 3.28. From the words of the Apostle Paul, there is neither what? Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all what? One in who? Christ Jesus. So after 34 AD, who are God's chosen ambassadors to the entire world? Who are they? Everyone who is in Christ Jesus, for we are one in Him. So no longer are we to look to the Middle East for the literal nation of Israel to continue to be God's chosen ambassadors or at another point in time down the track where they will once again take that privilege on board. Jesus said that privilege would last for 490 years. At the end of that time, that privilege will go to everyone, both Jew and Gentile, all who are one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as Daniel and Jesus prophesied, Jerusalem and its temple were destroyed by the Roman armies in 70 AD. Is that what Jesus said? Is that what Daniel wrote about? Let's have a look at what Daniel wrote. You're in Daniel 9? Daniel 9, very clear. Read verse 26. Ah, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And here we have it. Here we have the prophecy concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple in 70 AD. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the what? The city and the sanctuary or the temple. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. So there we have it. Let's keep reading in verse 27. Halfway down. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes what? Desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now how do I know that this is speaking of Jerusalem's destruction in 70 AD in its temple? Not only does Daniel clearly tell us that the people would reject the Messiah and then the city would be destroyed in its temple, but Jesus said it himself. Jesus said it himself. Have a look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15. Therefore when you see the abomination of what? Desolate, spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Matthew 24, as we discovered, is not only a chapter that deals with the signs of Christ's coming, but it's a chapter that also deals with the signs that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. So here Jesus is pointing his readers to the book of Daniel who prophesied some 500 years before that if the people would persist in rejecting the Messiah, after the allotted time, they would receive what they've asked for. Rejecting the Messiah. Leaving their fate in the hands of the Romans. Notice what Jesus also said in Luke 21.20. 20. Notice the wording. It's very specific. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by what? Armies. Then know that it's what? Desolation is near. Did we read about the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9? We most certainly did. Jesus here was quoting Daniel. You're thinking to yourself, but hang on a minute. I thought this 70th week was about the Antichrist. I thought it was about the Antichrist that was going to set up his kingdom in literal Israel, rebuild the temple, rebuild. Have we looked at a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ this morning? Nothing here about the Antichrist. That's a good question. Do you want to know how that theory came into the Christian church and how it's the most popular theory today? Well you need to write it down and I'll answer it 
<laughs> Don't have time to do that this morning. But it's a fascinating question how that came through. We'll look at that on another day. So here we have it. Daniel says the Messiah would be rejected and the city and its temple would be destroyed. That's what we have here in Daniel 9. Messiah rejected, city and the temple destroyed. Notice what the Bible says in John 1.11. He came to his own and his own did not what? How sad. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him. How sad. How very, very sad. Well, what about you and I, my friend? How is it for you? Jesus says, I'm coming to you. Will you receive me? Or will you too reject me? Like the leadership nearly 2,000 years ago. What does Jesus invite us to do? In Matthew 11:28, 28, he says, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you up. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. You and I have the opportunity to receive the Messiah and not reject him. Jesus comes and he knocks on the door of your heart. In Revelation 3.20, we read those precious words. Behold, I stand at the door and do what? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What's Jesus inviting you and I to? He's inviting us to a relationship. We end where we began. What does the Bible say? In John 17 verse 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is a most precious prophecy that we have looked at today that identifies Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Saviour of the world. But you know what? Knowing this prophecy, as beautiful a prophecy as it is, will not save you and I. It will not save us. There is only one thing that will save us and that is knowing Jesus Christ and having a relationship with Him based in His Word, based on love and trust. Jesus is the Messiah, no doubt about it. Daniel chapter 9 couldn't have been clearer. clearer. Jesus is the Messiah. But is He your Messiah? That's my question to you. Is He your Messiah? I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And if my ushers can, can give you a little card, I'm going to give you all, give all of us an opportunity to respond to Jesus as the Messiah. As we bring this message to a close. So if everyone could get a little card, I'd like to give you an opportunity to make a decision for the Messiah, for yourself. So if everyone could receive one, so if we could do that reasonably quickly, I'd like everyone to have one, every single person. Jesus came and he died for how many? He died for everyone. This message is for all. It's not for some, it's for all. So take a pen, little paper, and I want to give you an opportunity to commit your life to Jesus once again. Or maybe recommit your life to Jesus. Or maybe for the very first time, whatever the case may be. My decision for Jesus. My decision for Jesus. Firstly, I understood today's message. Did you understand today's message? Was it clear and from the Bible? If it was clear and from the Bible, put a tick in that first box. I've been trying over a number of years to simplify and make this message as clear as possible because it's so important. And so I want it to be clear and if it wasn't clear, don't tick that first box. If you, if you got lost somewhere down the track, don't tick that box. Hopefully you'll help me to understand where I lost you and, um, and I'll be able to improve on that next time. I understood today's message. If you did understand today's message, put a tick in that box. Secondly, I want to accept Jesus as my personal saviour. If you want to accept Jesus as your personal saviour, as your Messiah, put a tick in that second box. Thirdly, I would like to recommit my life to Jesus. You love Jesus. You're already a follower of His. You have already accepted Him as your Messiah. 
But today you want to say, yes, Lord, I want to recommit my life to you. Put a tick in that third box. And finally, yes, I would like you to pray for me. I love to pray for people. That's one of the things I love to do most, is to pray for people. If you'd like me to pray for you, just put a tick in that fourth box and I'd love to pray for you and just bring you before the throne of grace. If there's a particular prayer request that you have, just jot it on the back. And I can promise you that I will be the only one that will be looking at this little card. So it will be between you, me and the Lord. Amen? And so I'd love to pray for you. Whatever it is, whatever's on your heart, you'd like to have prayer. So just put your name there um, on the little card so I know who I'm praying for and I know who has made the decision for Jesus so that I can pray for that decision. Fold it up and we'll collect it off you at the end. If that's your decision, if, you're gonna, if you want to cling to the old rugged cross, cling to the one who was willing to place himself on that old rugged cross, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. If that's your decision and you want to cling to that cross, you want to cling to the one who is on that cross, looking forward to the day where one day when he will come in all his glory, and we'll exchange that cross for a crown. I want to invite you to stand as we close in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, wow. What love you have towards us to send your very one and only Son Jesus Christ to come to this world who was willing to be cut off, willing to be killed through no fault of his own because of your love, Father, for us. You were willing, you were willing to send Jesus to come and to be our Messiah, to be our Saviour, Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you are the Messiah. We thank you that you are our Saviour. And Lord, we just cling to that old rugged cross. We just cling to you. We pray that we will get to know you more and more each day through your word. Oh, bless us, Lord. Bless us. And lead us and guide us until that day when we exchange the old rugged cross for that beautiful crown that you want to give to each and every one of us. Bless us now, Lord, the rest of this day and keep us forever close to you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' precious name and all the people of God said, Amen, amen and Amen.